Kim, what's on your radar? Well, I want to tell you about the curious case of Elizabeth Holmes, the CEO of Theranos, who was recently just convicted of several counts of fraud. A lot of you probably didn't follow the case much. I know I certainly didn't. But the more I dug into it, the more fascinated I became. This story showcases the obscene amounts of money to be made off of big medicine, the revolving door of government officials into big corporations, the strategy of getting investors from powerful sectors like government, media, education, and medicine to hopefully act as buffers from criticism and ushers of praise. I think a lot of people will find a lot of interesting parallels to the current pandemic and the Toronto story even some of the same players. Now, Theranos claimed they had developed a blood testing machine that could take a tiny drop of blood and run numerous different medical tests just from that single drop. Normally, patients have to give up vials of blood that then get sent off to a big lab for various tests. It's a hassle, it's painful, it makes people queasy. Theranos claimed they had a solution to that in the form of a small machine the size of a home printer. Now, this was revolutionary. This would mean doctors' offices, clinics, and chain pharmacies like Walgreens could have a machine in-house and run tests for patients right in their own offices and stores in a matter of moments. This would obviously increase their profits, but also be amazing for patients since it means they could get life-altering test results conveniently, quickly, and at a lower and at a lower cost. The problem was it was a sham. It was later revealed the company's device gave inconsistent and often inaccurate results, and rather than admit failure, the startup company in secret began using standard run-of-the-mill blood testing machines while continuing to commit fraud against its investors, against its partners, and duping the public. Now, Elizabeth Holmes came up with the concept of a quick and simple blood test in 2003 when she was just a 19-year-old student at Stanford. She pitched the idea to several professors and experts who all said it was impossible. But finally, somebody believed in her, the dean of engineering, who became a board member and helped her meet with venture capitalists. For the next 10 years, Elizabeth quietly grew the company under the radar. Mine is getting some attention for attracting a board of directors that reads like a U.S. presidential cabinet roll call. Four-star General James Mattis, who a few years later went on to be Trump's defense secretary, was on the board of directors, as well as former secretaries of state Henry Kissinger and George Shultz, former defense secretary William Perry, retired U.S. Admiral Gary Ruffhead, former U.S. Senator Sam Nunn, as well as former Wells Fargo chairman and CEO Richard Kovacevich. Not only did the company have an all-star board of directors, but prominent investors as well. Betsy DeVos and the Walton family were big investors, as well as media titans Rupert Murdoch and the Cox family. Theranos raised a total of $700 million from investors in total. So things were going great. And it sounds like the bases were covered with former government officials sitting on the board and media titans heavily invested. The company was set up to be in the good graces of the nation's elite and would likely enjoy preferred treatment by the government and the media. In 2013, the company finally garnered some of that media attention for striking a partnership with Walgreens and a year earlier with Safeway. Editor-in-chief of Medscape, Eric, to Eric Topol, praised Elizabeth Holmes' Theranos technology as phenomenal, creating buzz and excitement around the company. And you might recognize Eric Topol as a prominent COVID pandemic voice who is aligned with Fauci and continues to advocate for vaccines and boosters to stop the spread. Eric works closely with the NIH and, is, and has been given nearly $250 million from the Institute for Research. So it's not a surprise he's aligned with Fauci's pandemic response. He even wins awards with Fauci. But back to Theranos. After the next few years, after the Walgreens partnership, business began to really boom for the company. The Cleveland Clinic announced a partnership, Theranos, and Theranos became the lab work provider for AmeriHealth, Caritas, and Capital Blue Cross. Theranos was named the 2015 Bioscience Company of the Year by the Arizona Bio Industry Association, and the FDA approved their finger stick blood testing device for herpes simplex one. So things were going great. The company received a valuation of $9 billion, and Elizabeth Holmes was praised as the next Steve Jobs. She even copied a style of only wearing black turtlenecks, and she was also named by Forbes as the youngest and wealthiest self-made female billionaire in America. Then came the downfall. 
while everyone was still high on the Theranos hog. In 2015, Stanford professor Dr. John Ioannidis was the first to criticize the company in the Journal of American Medical Association. He pointed out that the company had no peer-reviewed research and operated in secret. Now, you might recognize Dr. Ioannidis' name because he was censored early on in the pandemic for criticizing lockdown measures and scrutinizing the initial data from the Imperial College of London. But after his public criticism, more criticism followed. By October of 2015, John Carreyrou from the Wall Street Journal exposed the company's machines, gave inaccurate results, and at times was actually using run-of-the-mill standard blood testing equipment instead. The Ranos fought back. They hired attorneys and attempted to halt further negative reporting by contacting investor Rupert Murdoch. Earlier, they had also invited then-Vice President Joe Biden for a tour where he called Elizabeth Holmes inspiring. It was later reported by John Carreyrou that the company had actually set up a fake lab for Biden to tour. But despite their efforts, it was too late. The company was in a downward spiral. The FDA's long-running concerns about the company were brought to light. Various health agencies began to investigate the labs. Criminal investigations were opened. Lawsuits were filed. Settlements were reached. And by 2018, Theranos officially closed shop. Elizabeth Holmes and the COO of Theranos, Ramesh Balwani, were subsequently criminally charged with fraud, with Elizabeth being convicted this week of four counts of defrauding investors. She'll be sentenced to prison in a few months. Meanwhile, Balwani's trial is set for February. On one hand, this case gives us some hope, some hope that justice does get served from time to time. But on the other hand, the only people considered victims are the wealthy investors who were defrauded, not the average person who took the tests and relied on the results. Also, it's hard to believe that none of the prominent investors and board members were aware of the scheme. But then again, because none of them had any medical or tech expertise, it's not so hard to believe after all, I suppose. It's likely they were just enticed by the money they know the medical industrial complex brings, which is a problem in and of itself. Medicine shouldn't be so lucrative. Another thing this case exposes is the opportunism of our government officials. It's obvious the board was assembled to gain influence within the government to perhaps secure lucrative government contracts. We see it all the time. Government officials later going on to sit on boards of big corporations, helping them secure millions of taxpayer dollars in the form of government contracts. Theranos gaining Rupert Murdoch and the Cox family as investors also showcases a major weak spot in our news system. How can news be objective? when the owners are personally invested in the various companies that would likely deserve scrutiny. But before I wrap this up, I do have to touch on the controversy surrounding Elizabeth Holmes' voice. <laughs> it appears that her line goes beyond the machines. So I wanna list, uh, have you listen to her speak here. We want to be um, the vehicle for real-time access to health information. And we want to be the vehicle for making early detection and prevention realities for as many people as possible in the context of seeing the onset of disease when there's time to do something about it. And, and that is what, what our work is, is all about. Now, people claim she faced, forced this sort of fake, deep baritone voice to appear more credible and that this clip is actually her real voice. It turned out he had a nub on his elbow and... We talked to our lab team and they said, okay, you can do the draw. And so they did this, what would have been a finger stick on this little nub on his arm. And he broke into tears because up until that point, the way that they had had to draw blood is through a needle in his neck. And it's so painful and um, so dehumanizing that um, it's an incredibly emotional process. So what is interesting about the way that technology can be applied is we certainly didn't design this with that use case in mind. Did you guys hear that change at the end, how she went from the high to the lows? I don't know. I mean, a lot of controversy around her voice. I think that's so fascinating. People point to it as sort of like, a, you know, a symptom of maybe being a sociopath, you know, putting on that deep voice and, and making people believe that, you know, that's your real voice. I don't know. What do you guys think? I thought it would be more dramatic, the voice difference. I didn't hear a... Well, there's other clips. my hearing's bad. I didn't hear a huge there's difference. There's other clips, too, where you can, where you can hear her, where real you can deep. hear her kind of real voice. Yeah. Where, uh, and there's a huge and, gap yeah. between what the real voice is and the, and the deep voice. And it almost, I feel pity, in a way, when I hear that. It's like, you really felt like you had to change your your voice in order to be taken more seriously. 
Uh, her voice sounds fine. Like her, her, her that real yeah. voice, the the slightly mm. higher pitched voice that, that you heard you, in the second clips. It's fine. Don't be. You, you're fine. You're fine. I think it's because, you know, you have to remember she did start the company when she was only 19, 20 years old. So she was young. This is like the early days when startups were, you know, really starting to, to take off in the second round of kind of like the the, the new dot com, right? The, the mm -hmm. Silicon Valley startups. And so she's competing against all of these, you know, these other startup companies with all these men leading the companies. And so she wears the black turtleneck. You know, she there's controversy even around that. She says, well, no, my mom always dressed me in these turtlenecks. And then People at the company said, no, we gave her the idea to look like Steve Jobs. So she always wore the black turtleneck. And then she changed her voice to maybe sound older, more right. credible. Well, she uh, yeah, the black turtleneck was just a complete parody. Like Silicon, the show Silicon Valley could barely have gotten away with that. Uh, <laughs> but she, so she, she, more seriously, she testified over a seven day period, I guess the last week or two. And a, a lot of her testimony focused on what she claimed was this abusive relationship that she was in with yeah. Balwani. And one of the things that uh, she said that Balwani did was constantly call her a little girl, and you know, not smart enough, not important enough, too much of a baby, and that she needed to grow up and grow into her, you know, a, a, a more mature, serious person if she wanted to be taken seriously. And you could, you could see if that's if that's true. And he, they, he, he, his lawyers deny it, but if that's true, you could see that type of emotional abuse uh, leading to her saying, "Well, one of the ways that I'm going to satisfy this is by going in with this deeper voice." What an interesting defense, right? I mean, to say, well, uh, yeah. the reason Didn't why work. I defrauded, yeah. right, right, all of these, million, these people from millions was because I was in an abusive relationship with the COO. I, you know, it's like, you're still the CEO of the company. I don't know how an abusive relationship would cause you to to go and lie to people and, and uh, defraud them rather than, rather than admit failure, you know? <laughs> Saying the device doesn't work. We tried, we failed, we did what we could. <laughs> Right, and the and the prosecutors, you know, were able to suss out uh, that she she didn't actually even claim that the abuse was directly linked to the to the fraud. It was it was more right. a muddled, muddled together thing that she didn't know who she was and uh, also abuse. I mean, she was maybe she was very much in a bad relationship. You know, an experience lots of people have. So it, it, like that could have been bad, but not didn't fly. You know. Yeah. Like, Abuse because he said belittling things to her. I was mean, a, it was it was the best say, she had. Yeah, is this your yeah. voice, yeah, Robbie? Was, though this is not mine. Yeah, you should, you all should hear Ryan when he's not yeah. on camera. Once the uh, mic comes off, yeah, yeah. then it's uh, <laughs> Wicked Witch of the West. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> totally different voice. Well, it's very interesting, and we'll see. I mean, I think she's facing quite a bit of time, twenty up, upwards of twenty years or more, but they yeah. don't think she's going to get that much time in prison. So. Well, we we'll talked about this happens. yesterday. I don't know. What do you think, Kim, before we go? I, I, neither of us thought uh, she should go to jail for, maybe she should go for a very short period of time, but she's not a day, she's not going to stab anyone when, not, not, when she's out of prison. She's not a physical threat. She's, nobody's going to take money from her, uh, 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 give her give money, money again, and right. if they do, they deserve to get <laughs> scammed. So, like, what is the, it, it's just punitive, but I don't really believe in prison in just a punitive sense. So I, I you know, I hope she spends, like, a month or maybe a, maybe a few months in prison, probably. Yeah, I mean, I agree with you. I think there's other ways to be punitive. You don't need to put, you don't need to throw people into jail. I think there's plenty of other ways, you know, creative things that we could come up with that would say, you know, this is your punishment for defrauding all these people for so long. I don't know. I mean, but I, I, I agree with you. I don't think prison is for people that don't commit violent crimes. Um, right. I know a prison lot of people Prison is for people that, who are dangerous, who are current active violent threats, threats is yeah, my view. Yeah. Right. That's, I, I agree with you on that, but there's the prison industrial complex and... Right. We're trying to combat that as well, so and she'll a lot be of money that, to be made. She'll be at that nice one in Connecticut anyway. Uh, where Martha went? Is she going to yeah, go where? <laughs> pro probably, yeah. Or maybe she'll just get house arrest. I don't know. I mean, not, none of them are nice, but it's like you're less likely to be raped and killed. Which is a good thing, that you should be less likely it, to have that happen to you in all prisons. Absolute human well, rights it, it crisis. Not, that, right. Yeah. I haven't seen the movie yet, but you know the, the Gucci movie with Lady Gaga and the woman, the actual... Uh, wife of Gucci. I was reading about her bio a little bit, and she didn't even want to get out of prison. 
she was there and then they they said if you get out of prison you have to get a job like we'll let you out early if you get a job and she's like i don't want to get a job i'll just stay here so <laughs> can't, you know wherever she was it must wow. not have been that bad wow the gucci prison all yeah. right well we'll be back with more rising in just a minute stay with us